Good morning. I'm Robert Wilson Jr., uh, Chairman of Alamo Trust. Um, I'm asked to have a forum. I found a little piece on the roll. Hope you're on it. Here. Francisco Cigarroa on the phone. Jim Dan, Bob on the phone. I'm here. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Rick Cohen's on the phone. Gene Powell here. Welcome to Wilson. Here. Um, yeah, we, have a, we have a forum. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming this morning. Uh, the uh, first item on the agenda is uh, a video. Uh, if we can get the video Second. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is resol resi resi resolution designating authority for check writing. Yes, in, in your booklet there is a copy of a resolution. CEO's ability to delegate check signing authority. Basically, he can delegate under the authority he has, as already approved by the board. And so that's up for approval by the board today. Great. As I understand, that's not a general authority, right? I mean, that's not a general uh, designation. That's on, that's on a case by case basis. Right. 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 Under the direction of the CEO. Right. Any questions? No, I'll entertain the motion to approve. I move the um, passage of the resolution. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item number three is whistleblower policy approval. <coughs> uh, Doug, I believe you're. Yeah, so um, the out, every uh, good governance for nonprofits has had a whistleblower procedure whereby anybody who uh, is suspicious of or concerned about any kind of act has, has protection to file any complaint. Make that issue aware of the board or management, and so we have a whistleblower policy that's circulated to you, and that policy allows for staff to directly bring a matter of attention to the CEO. If there's concerns about the conduct of the CEO, it's stipulated that that person can contact the board chair directly uh, and bring any concerns they have. So, um, the person is afforded confidentiality; they can be anonymous if they want to be. We encourage them. Uh, to not be, but they can bring anonymous complaints or whatever. It's just a, I think it's a good governance um, document, something that uh, we want to do, and therefore we have proposed that for board approval. Great. Well, I appreciate uh, you and your staff and everybody working on this and getting this uh, memorialized. Any uh, questions? If not, we entertain a motion to approve the whistleblower policy, please. So, so second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next item number four, bylaw amendment. Gary? Yes, sir. Because of some changes in the uh, board uh, makeup, <coughs> just proposing today we'll be sending around bylaw amendments soon that correct some uh, or adjust some items in the bylaws based on the change of makeup of the board. Yeah. So that's really a future item, but it, it's in here for y'all's consideration. You can read about it. Those will be coming around either at the next meeting or at a special. Meeting. Right, so no, no action today. No action today. Yeah, super. Uh, item number five, 401k, employee pension amendment. So, our current 401k, we need a couple of changes in the 401k plan. One is we've changed the corporate name, so we need to change the corporate name on the 401k plan. Um, the second um, change we're proposing to make is our present plan is that if you're an employee um, on December 31st, that we then will match your contributions. But if you, um, for the prior year. So it's set up that, it, that staff who might be only working for a couple of months and make a contribution, it's maxed out at 8%, are matched, but staff who have worked for years and then actually terminate their employment in the last part of the year, they would not be matched for the contribution. Um, so first off, we think that that's not a good policy. Um, secondly, it's really hard to administer because you have to go back and look and see well, who, who stopped, who started and stopped employment when, make that calculation, make sure you get them all right. And the easier way to do it to make it work on a payroll system is to create a date on which to become eligible and then to make the contributions of 401k on every payroll period when the employee makes that matching contribution. So it's easier to administer. We think it's better for the employees. Uh, we did a... So in the past, there was no vesting period or no period of longevity before it activated. So if you started employment on, January, on December 1st and you made your contribution, you were actually matched on December 31st. So what we did in the plan is we said, um, we're going to wait six months. So you can be unemployed for six months before we start doing this. That actually kind of created a minor offset in what the cost would be. So any additional cost for matching employees on a payroll basis is mitigated. Our total payroll cost, our total cost of plan last year is $149,000. We estimate this will add $2,000 additional expense for the year, but we think it's better for the employees and we think it's it's much easier to administer. So we're asking for your approval to make those amendments in the plan documents 
So and it seems like a fair approach. And, and you know, one thing for sure is it's a clear abuse to everyone, including the employees of the bank. So now it is a crystal clear procedure to do this. The employees will be appreciated. So I, I appreciate your uh, tackling this. Any questions? If not, entertain a motion to approve the 401k employee pension. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion here. Uh, next item is under tab C, which is the uh, report to the board. Uh, uh, listed here, Doug, if you'll take it from the top. I sure. appreciate it. So the report we gave the board uh, covers the, the period of time from January 1st to March 31st of this year. Um, a couple of things. I'm just I'm just gonna I'm gonna start on page uh, two and I'll tell you when I change pages so you can kind of follow this or if you've got questions and go through it. But, um, a couple of things you might notice uh, happening right now. Actually, this week we've opened up a new retail outlet on Crockett Street that's being run by Event Network. And so it's an opportunity for people to actually purchase Alamo related uh, merchandise um, without coming into the property. So we think it's an opportunity to do this storefront. Uh, the GLO was, was real cooperative with us in making that space available, so we're filling that retail space. The store opens this week. Uh, also, in this time period, we Opened the new exhibit, uh, Fortress Alamo, which you saw in the board video, and we also launched new family-friendly walking tours in February. Um, our attendance uh, this year in this period of time has been 1.2 million. Uh, from the, this is a fiscal year to date number. is 1.2 million. We're up 17 percent over last year in the same time period. We've also, I'm always really happy about student engagement. We've had 31,000 school children engaged in programs we're doing. And we're running about a 34% capture rate on the Alamo exhibit for people who are coming uh, through the property. The way we kind of measure how well we do on our, on our changing exhibits is what's the capture rate relative to total attendance? It's never going to match it. And 34% is running uh, pretty good on that. On page three, I mentioned a little bit about the, um, about the attendance, attendance numbers, um, but also just the, we've got a nice media um, plug. Uh, on the new children's tour and the annual commemoration programming we put at the top, uh, that to, under, to fully understand the history of Texas, you must experience the Alamo. The exhibits are thoughtfully uh, displayed and the grounds were beautifully well maintained. So that's, well, that's what we aspire to do every day, and I think the staff here does a great job of, of doing uh, performing on that. Uh, I would note on our attendance um, in the first quarter, we're up uh, 4%, um, up 7%. And in March, though, I would note that I think it's really a remarkable number is if you look back two years ago, we had 136,000 people uh, in in March of uh, 2016, and this year we had 180,000. So we're looking at almost a 50,000 increase in the month of, month of March. And I think some of that's been due to the increased programming we've done around commemoration and around those events. Yeah, I have a question. So do you think the increase also was attributed to the final four? Um, Visitors? Final four was it factors into that, but um, but I can't say for sure. I have to go back and look at the daily numbers, and I don't want to. I don't want to. It's a little highlight. What, um, what I don't. I looked at the, I looked at all the daily reports. I know the final four ran strong, but did not run strong as like commemoration weekend. Is that and, right? Yeah, and even Fiesta, which is outside the side period, mm -hmm. Fiesta even runs um, ran stronger as well. So. Good to know. Thank you. Spring breaks are really our hot period. You know, that's yeah, it was a spring break month. Yes. Yeah. On page four, I would just note um, our volunteer program continues to grow and to do well. And this year, we brought in 22 new active volunteers. And on page five, we did a monetary calculation of that in the first quarter. And so, the first quarter, that's uh, that's a uh, the value of that is about $78,000 in one quarter for volunteers. So uh, while that program is growing and it's really active, it really does pay off in really tangible uh, value to the organization. So if someone wants to volunteer, what's the procedure? Uh, you can just you can contact us through our website, uh, in info at alamo.org, and then we'll have somebody follow up with you. Or you can just call in and say, I'd like to volunteer, and, we'll, and we sign you up. We've got a volunteer person who works at that registers people, trains them, finds out what area they want to volunteer in. Um, so you see a lot of volunteers around the Living History Weekends. We're really lucky in that respect that a lot of uh, people who are reenactors come in and, and give time and energy, and especially when you're doing something big like the Cannon Fest, and, and 
a lot of volunteers coming to make those events happen. That's great. How do we appreciate them? Pardon? How do we appreciate them? Well, we recognize them. We had a recognition event um, a couple Saturdays ago, and one of, kind of one of my favorite events. And, uh, and so you, you thank them often. You treat them well. Um, we have some limitations on things we can do just because of regulations on how we on how we can spend money. Uh, but we so we have to do it with you know, good positive personal affirmations. And we did have a, a volunteer uh, banquet, uh, volunteer uh, luncheon, and uh, to the credit of the staff because we are really limited, we can't buy meals off the state funds. So the credit of the staff, the staff all made all the food, okay, and brought the food in to thank the volunteers. So that's how we made that event happen. Good to hear. Um, Pam, page six, we talked a little bit about audio tours, and what I'd say on audio tours is. Um, while I like the trend line over a two-year period, we're not really satisfied with where we are in the current year, um, in the first quarter. Uh, we're up 12 percent on that on the audio tour sales. Um, while it's still a lot higher than it was two years ago, our goal is to really drive those numbers year after year and get incremental growth and impact on that. So, um, so we're uh, we're developing some strategies to kind of see if we need to adjust our point of sales, uh, how we make the sales, so we can get a higher capture rate. System for selling. Yeah, you can kind of report back to us on that because it is important. To, uh, okay. A track it and be always you know, figure out how to improve the experience. Thank you. And I'm going to flip you a couple of pages just so you move on. I'm going to flip you all the way to page 10. Um, I'm always a sucker for the education programs, so that comes from being in the museum field for so long, I think. Um, one of the really great things about the Alamo is that the history is important, not just to Texans, but to really people nationally. And people are really intrigued with how we tell the history. Um, it's really a very, it's a comprehensive and complex history. There's so many nuances uh, that are important to tell. And so we had two education, educator workshops that were highly attended uh, this year. One was on the military and Mexican independence in 1803 to 1821, and then the colonialization and Texas Revolution from 1821 to 1836. And we get a lot of teacher participation that comes, and this is how teachers find out how to tell, to how to teach Texas history. So uh, we've been really seen as a go-to resource by teachers. And this is one of the programs we, we really hope to expand in the future. Uh, secondly, it was really great this year that we had, um, the San Antonio is such a great convention market, we get opportunities created by that convention market as well. And so the National School Board Association was here, and we presented the National School Board Association and we also presented the National Council for History Education. So, um, so those are just great, uh, <coughs> great things you get to by, by virtue of being in San Antonio and by being in the Alamo. Doug, could I ask you a question? The, I see that you got uh, the distance education. Well, that is for students, is not for the teachers, is that right? That's, that's, that's students, yes. Okay. Yeah. Is there an opportunity to do distance education for the educators? There is. We, um, it's kind of in our program plans for the future. It's some of the things we're looking at in the in part of what you're part of, you see know, the details on the interpretive master plan we're doing. So all those sorts of things are fitting into that interpretive master plan concept in terms of how do we do future interpretation, how do we develop capacity, what kind of technological resources do we have. We look forward to actually having a museum building. And we can actually have spaces that are actually set up to do this kind of distance learning. Uh, we can produce the content. We can do it live uh, interactions, or we can just produce the content and make it available online for uh, for teachers and students and both to download. The uh, this education part is so important. Uh, it really is. Uh, I think a big job of ours is to is to help you know, every little kid learn about Texas history and the Alamo and the battle and, uh, and just keep that in front of the education. It's one of the things we're really limited in terms of how well we can do that right now, and it's one of the major considerations we're putting in terms of design for the future, is how do we set up the you know, school bus drop-off zones, pick-up zones, how do we set up to actually, you have to, you have to pulse schools through it because they don't come one or two or five, they, they come in, you know, how many, one, two or five bus loads, and so you have to how to keep those groups together and manage all that, and it takes a lot of infrastructure we don't presently have, um, but I know there's a lot of thought in yeah. how to plan that. And while I love distance learning, I think it's a great thing. 
there's nothing that replaces people actually coming to and experiencing the Alamo. So, so to me, distance learning is about how we how we do reach people who literally can't get here. But to me, it's also a way for schools to get an opportunity to learn about what they're going to discover when they get here. So we can prepare them before they show up, and then we can also pre prepare for them some reflective and reinforcing tools for them when the teachers get back to the classroom and think, they will. When you're at the Alamo, remember when we saw this and when we saw that. It's education. We cannot educate a student to learn a lot of content about Texas history, about the history of San Antonio, about the whole era, the 300 years of history we try to tell. If we think that our entire opportunity to impact them is the hour and a half that they're here. So, so that really takes reinforcement through a whole process. And so that's all in our planning structure. <coughs> Turn to page 11. Um, <laughs> one of the unique things I find about the Alamo compared to all the rest of my museum career is people really pay attention to you more than I've ever seen before in my career. Um, and so, you know, so in, in three months, we've had 15.8 million Facebook impressions. Uh, that's pretty astronomical. 700,000 uh, Twitter impressions. Uh, so people do pay attention to anything that says the Alamo. <coughs> These are we're only counting the ones that talk about us as the Alamo. If you look at the Twitter feed on just the words the Alamo, uh, it's probably quadruple that. Page 11, we talk about some of our public programming we did, and what I want to just kind of pay attention to specifically, page 12, I'm sorry, is the, in the bottom section we talk about what we did commemoration uh, this year. Um, uniquely this year, we decided that instead of doing events just um, for several days or points around the commemoration or just doing things around March 6th, we decided we wanted to do the entire 13 days and we actually did 14 days of programming. So we did 14 days of programming. We had over 51,000 visitors that participated in the programming when we conducted that. Uh, we, had, we had really small, intimate, really great events. We had an evening with heroes. We had 330 people came for an evening program. That was a fee-based program, um, so people paid for that. We made some money on it, but it paid for all the costs of the program, and it was a really kind of immersive experience for people. Um, we had a Never Surrender or Retreat uh, event. They had over 6,000 people, focusing on Travis's uh, famous letter of February 24th. And we had the Return of the Cannons event, which was a great event um, that we held with Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Commissioner George P. Bush. Um, we're here, uh, they, where they welcome back the full, first fully restored, restored battle cannons uh, back to the Alamo, which we've now installed here. We'll talk a little more about that later. We had the Crockett Fiddle Festival, um, which had over 6,000 people at that event, where I had the pleasure myself of meeting, uh, uh, meeting the person that they, the perfect in, uh, impression of Davy Crockett, you know, five-year-old young man, um, who, uh, who shows up here. Um, several times a month, uh, and his parents bring him because he wants to be no place other than the Alamo, and he comes in full Davy Crockett uh, regalia, and, and we went and celebrated his birthday when he turned six, um, and they, so they invited, so I, went, I thought it was a big deal, we were talking to him, chatting with him, and said, can I take a picture with you, because I thought he was so cute, and he said, oh, and his mom said, that's fine, that's fine, he loves his picture taken, and <laughs> I kind of suspected that, and so they invited him. They invite us to come to his birthday party. So we went to his birthday party uh, and helped him celebrate that too. Uh, just a great thing to be here. We also did um, Remember the Defenders event, um, on which had over 4,500 people, honoring the famous uh, Alamo Defenders. And with that, we're really pleased to report that we did this as a partnership program with the Alamo Defender Descendants Association. And had a tribute, had a really special um, event that we worked with Lee Spencer White, who's here today, as a part of that. And it was a, it was a great event. We also created on page 13, um, in addition to the uh, Alamo Descendant Defenders Association, we also did partnership programs with the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, with the Sons of the Republic of Texas, with the San Antonio Living History Association, uh, with the Grand Lodge of Texas, and many other groups. So one of the things we're trying to do is find ways we can expand our programming by actually having partnership with other organizations. It allows them to bring their energy, their knowledge, and table, we were able to bring some of our resources, and we do these things as collaborative partners, and so we develop the programs together, and we share in that, and I think it's been successful and really well received by all of the organizations that we've done that with so far. 
we constantly do event rental sales. We ran out this room, and we also ran out for private events. But uh, we, and in this period of time, we have 26 private military corporate events um, with over 2,700 uh, people attending. We had one event, I think they had 700 people in one evening. That was our largest event that we, that we held. If you turn to the page 14, I always like these heat maps we provided to the board to show where people came from. Um, and the way we monitor this, because we don't, because we're free and public, we monitor this by actually recording the zip codes of everybody that has a gift shop transaction. So while you know, it's, you know, you can get, find probably a statistically more accurate way to you know total visitation, but this is the people who've actually been here as visitors who made an intentional effort to visit, not somebody just kind of coming by. And so, so we think it's a pretty good gauge, and it's probably pretty accurate in what we um, what we give up in actually having a. a Kind of a scientific sampling, we, we actually we actually gain by the numbers of people we're able to record. And so, what this shows is that out of Texas, um, our number one metro area is Dallas Fort Worth with six percent. Uh, San Antonio, uh, Houston comes in second with five percent, and San Antonio comes in uh, in third place with three point six eight percent. We turn then over to uh, I'm amazed how many people come. The Northeast number is interesting, and I think the other thing that people are always amazed at is that seventy percent of our visitors come from outside of Texas. So, so it's like twenty-seven percent of our visitors are from Texas, and, and the seventy-two percent come from outside Texas. So, um, and, and these are people who are in the gift shop. So this doesn't count the people that are taking the selfie and walking past the front. These are people who actually made an effort to go through the church and have spent time on the grounds. Um, you know, it's really kind of amazing. Texans, how, what percent of Texans, what percent of San Antonio's, and what percent of other places in Texas? Well, San Antonio's 0.4%. Uh, so 95% of, of the other Texans are. 95% of the attendees are not from San Antonio. Yeah. On page 18, we just mentioned um, a few of the um, other events we've been working on. Um, We've got coming up. Uh, we've got coming up in the future, but we've got. Um, I think I'll pull that actually to a little bit later. On page 19, we um, talk about the Cannon Restoration Project, and that's um, that's really been exciting to us. That we're actually taking the original battle cannons from the Alamo, and we are um, and we're conserving them with Texas A&M. And these cannons have sat outside for 50 years. Have really suffered from sitting outside on a concrete base and it rusted because of having the metal next to concrete which is acidic and so we're sending off to Texas A&M um, you know, we're able to discover things like the four pounder that came back was actually cast in Sweden so so it allows us to tell a story about you know you just don't realize that, the, that you know San Antonio here you are in, in the 19, early 19th century and it's international commerce is taking place and whether it's you know, cannons or other goods you know, international trade was very active and taking place in that time period. Um, so we've done that, and we now we're moving through. We just set up. Um, we, we've now gotten four cannons that have been done and have, are reinstalled here, and we're reinstalling them on the arcade just to the south of the church. And some people say, "Why are you installing them the way you are?" Because we're actually pointed down on, on mounts. Well, that's actually the traditional way you mount retired cannons. And so first off, it's a traditional way you do a retired cannon. And secondly, it actually protects them more. So they get some break from being underneath the, the, um, the arches of the arcade. And secondly, by having the muzzle pointed down and the glass they point down, they don't collect moisture inside, which is what causes a lot of rust and damage to them. So we hope someday to have everyone of these cannons inside our new museum. Um, and so, so we have two more there. And, and we got two over there now. And the, the interesting thing is we have nine. Yeah, we've got 21 cannons. I think we've got nine that are actually battle cannons. No. Yeah. No, no, we're 20. We have nine at 21. Yeah, so there were 21 at the battle. Yeah. We have nine. The others. Uh, yeah. So we, well, they're different, but we, we know where there's two at Lavalita. At the entrance there, there were battle cannons, and Red McCombs has one that's in the Briscoe. Um, so we know where a few are. Um, what I would say, it's kind of interesting going on right now is, 
there's speculation if the cannon that we just sent to Texas A&M is a 16-pounder or if it is the 18-pounder. And, and so people have debated this for a long time. So so now we, now the big debate begins. You know, which is it? And when we get done with this, we, we hope to have an answer to that. Um, so is it the You're talking about the 18-pounder that was at the southwest corner right. of the compound? So some people have always said this is the 18-pounder. The, um, there's also the opinion that that's a 16-pounder. What we're hoping to determine through Texas A&M and doing the research on it is actually perhaps to get a conclusive answer to that and know if we have that 18 pounder or if we just have a really cool big 16 pounder. So either one. One of those we prefer, but we don't we don't prejudice the outcome. On page 20, we talk a little bit about our security uh, system upgrades. I think the most important things about, about that are that we've really been upgrading our, um, our CCTV system. And so we've got a lot more observation of the premises uh, that we can do today than we were able to do a year ago. And so it's been a pretty substantial increase. Uh, also, if you notice, our rangers now uh, have two weapons on their belts. Uh, they have one that, that you're probably really familiar with, and they have that, that yellow one, which is a taser. And so we felt like um, it was important to have non-lethal response methods. Uh, available to the rangers, um, and so we invested in the tasers, and all of our rangers have now gone through the training, the formal training and certification program. So they all go through the training, and they're all certified for the use of tasers. Um, we also added three additional rangers to our force in January, so they're um, they're on duty and they're uh, and they're fully deployed. So that's what I would tell you. It's been a very busy uh, three months at the Alamo. Um, but every day is exciting, and, uh, and we have a lot of great things in the future as well. Okay, please uh, give our appreciation to staff for you know, executing all these. Like I said, a lot of work went into, uh, you know, from the video to this list, it's no small task to uh, produce these things on a daily basis. So uh, everyone should surely appreciate that. Our uh, next item, number nine, uh, one, uh, five, under, under five, number nine is interpreted. Update. Uh, Gene, could you give us a sure. quick update on where the interpretive plan is? So, for the board's um, identification, bring you up to date, the, um, in October of 2015, we signed an agreement with the city of San Antonio and with the GLO for a committee to do the master plan supervise the master plan, and then supervise the interpretive design. The master plan, that committee met every Tuesday for three years. Uh, it's still meeting. Uh, we met Monday afternoon for four hours. Uh, it's become a real labor of love. <laughs> Nobody on the committee is getting paid for that. You have two members from the endowment. That's uh, I'm on the committee and Ramona Bass is on the committee. Two members from the city of San Antonio, that's uh, Councilman Trevino, and uh, City Manager Cheryl, uh, two members from the GLO, and currently uh, Brian Preston and uh, Hector Valle are serving. Uh, the committee has uh, accepted the master plan and was approved by the City Council last August. It's in place. Um, we're right now, right now, um, we're extremely active working on uh, site design, and on the. Did we lose somebody? Yeah, I'm going to put myself on mute. Okay, sir. Thanks. Uh, welcome, Francisco. We're glad to have you. Um, the committee is working extremely hard, paying a lot of attention all the public input that we got during all of our public meetings which was extremely helpful to what the committee is doing with the site designers today and with the interpretive planners. Um, also very helpful is um, this, the GLO has just finished uh, how many cities did, you, did they do? Ten. Ten, ten Texas cities where they took the uh, tour on the road, met with citizens across the state, presented uh, the master plan, uh, discussed what was going on at the Alamo, uh, got input from them 
Um, there's also a survey out in the field with uh, Texans, uh, what they think about the Alamo and what we should be doing here. So we're taking all of that input into consideration. Um, the committee continues to want to produce for Texas and for San Antonio a world-class experience for visitors and an absolute world-class museum uh, to show the artifacts that we have and to um, show the artifacts that came to us from uh, the Phil Collins exhibit, which are currently stored in Austin in the vault, and we can't uh, show them. And uh, just to give the uh, board a little uh, experience, uh, early on here, uh, the staff allowed me to put on the white gloves and to hold the saber uh, that came from Phil Collins that will be eventually displayed in, in the museum. And uh, I said, so what's special about the saber? And they said, well, would you put your reading glasses on and read the hilt that's inscribed. It's a brass hilt around the top of the sword. And so I started to get this where I could read. And uh, it said, Presidente General Antonio Lopez de San Ana. They said, you're holding Santa Ana's battle saber. And I said, wow. Well, you know, how do we how do we display this? Well, we've got to find a place. I mean, it's so valuable. It came from Bill. And it's so valuable. And the ability to display this uh, and his 1835 uh, rifle. Uh, so we're working to how do we incorporate an absolutely world class museum into this experience for the visitors so that we can display all of this. And then we've got the situation that the greatest artifact that we have, this is going to be a living museum. And, partially open-air museum and the biggest artifacts that we have and the best for the church and long here. So preservation of those items and incorporating them into the museum experience um, is really difficult uh, and the designers are working overtime uh, to get that done. And I think before too long we're going to be able to show some of this to the public and get their uh, response to it. A uh, city's very engaged one Y'all all should thank the city, the mayor, the council, uh, Cheryl Scully and Roberto Trevino are at every meeting, and that's many, many hours of work on their behalf. Um, the, uh, there's no deadline for the council to uh, do the final approval on this. Uh, we'd like to get most of this work completed for the summer, but we're not going to be rushed into uh, getting it right. So just in the, that's just an update. Uh, if any of the any of the board has any questions for me, I'd be glad to try to answer them. But uh, just want you to know that that work is uh, ongoing, and I think we'll be able to see some of it this summer. Great, Mom. Well, really, I know there's a lot of volunteer hours that go into this by a lot of young people, so it's much appreciated. And the end goal is to is to open end of 2023, I think. In 2023, so if you back up from there, there are certain things we have to get going now in order to. When we did the master plan, welcome. We looked at planning, construction, all the work that had to be done, and we backed up. And so that's the schedule that we're on: is to stay on that schedule so that we have the, the total new experience, the new museum, and everything in place for the celebration of the Alamo being built in this site. The original Alamo, as you all know, 1718, which is what we date the city to, but the Alamo was built somewhere else at that point, and the Alamo was moved in 1724 to this location. So the 300th anniversary of this location is 2024, and we want to have all of this ready uh, for that celebration. And I'm sure the city has a big plan yeah. for but it'll be uh, the end of 2023 will be here before we know it. It doesn't. It seems like yesterday that we started this. It was March of 2015. And it seems like yesterday. So you know, it, time's flying by. And, and, and one thing I've come to appreciate is constru there's construction and then there's construction <coughs> in the historic setting, which is a whole different overlay of protocol and, and uh, things that you have. It, it adds a, it adds several layers of difficulty. But we've got extremely good people working on that, protecting these assets. 
Very so good. unless you all have any questions, that's all I have to report. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, Doug, you want to expand a little bit on the on the uh, Alamo Treasure Roadshow? I know that that just recently was completed, right? Yep. We uh, so one of our things that we did we had lots of public hearings in San Antonio and lots of meetings, but uh, the Alamo. Uh, a lot about Texas history and statewide. There's a lot of statewide interest, so we decided to, to put together an Alamo Roadshow and go out there and talk to. So we went to ten cities across Texas. We started April 9th and we got done on May 1st. Um, we went to Laredo, um, we went to El Paso, Midland, Lubbock, Abilene, Tyler, Rockwall, College Station, uh, Waco, McAllen, and, and Laredo. Um, while we we're on the road, we talked with, uh, spoke with a lot of people who gathered information on Alamo defenders. Um, Descendants of Defenders on Texas Revolutionaries, on Texas Rangers, government officials, and just lots of other groups that were very interested in what we were doing. Um, we also did a, kind of just a, a simple survey instrument of people and had a lot of, and gave her a chance to make comments uh, on the result of it. And I think the, the kind of pre predominant number one um, response to that was, oh, this is a what you're planning on doing or contemplating doing isn't anything like what I read on social media in the news. And, and that was by far the biggest response. And, and we had people who came to these meetings uh, ready to fight, and by the time they left, they go, oh, well, that's what I always thought you should do. And they said, thank you. And so, so I think it was really successful in that regard. Um, the media reports, state, the media uh, reporting on this statewide were really all positive. And I, so I don't think we, I don't think the Alamo we've gone through uh, We've had a month of nothing but positive media uh, for a long time, but we definitely that roadshow was really successful in that regard. So it was just one of our many ways we try and communicate the public, and we'll be doing you know more things. Obviously, we get as Gene mentioned, as we have more plans and more things to show, we'll, we'll talk about it. Everything's building on that master plan, though, and so it was a it was a good good result. We also have people who brought amazing artifacts or that they own personally. Um, I remember watching Ernesto uh, in McAllen. Um, looking at a young lady who came with a, a linen map that I think Ernesto was jealous of and he wanted to see if he could talk her into giving it to our collection. Uh, but it was fascinating artifacts. Some people just brought things and they said, look, this is an important piece of history in my family. Um, what can I do to take better care of it? And so in the case of the map, Ernesto told the young lady that she needed to quit folding it. <laughs> it was the biggest thing she could Quit folding your map. And, and so... Uh, and so we went through that. I know Dr. Winters talked to some people about important documents people had that they helped that were hundreds of years old and how they could better con uh, conserve them and protect them. And also it gives us an opportunity if we're doing exhibits in the future. And we, for instance, that map that young lady has in Gallon, we now know where that map is. We've got her information. And if that fit in an exhibit, I'm sure uh, that she was appreciative that she would loan that to us in the exhibit in the future. So that's one of the reasons that we felt like this was not just to go out and talk to people, but, but to listen to people, and also let them bring their stories to us. So people would come to us and they would say, well, and we would record them. So here's my story, my personal story, how I connect to Texas history. From People go back all, all the way to, to, the, to the Spanish era, and, the, and, and to the Mexican era, to, and to the Revolutionary era. So it was, a, it, was, it was a great thing. It was a chance for our museum curatorial team uh, to go out to talk to people and get to do what museum people just love to do, and that's you know listen to people's personal history, um, help them understand their history, and also to get to look at some kind of pretty cool artifacts that we didn't know were out there. Uh, the press that we got on that is it on our available on our website? The what now? The press. The, the press. articles that you did. I don't think we posted them on the website. Could we post them so that people could? We'll, we'll, we'll work at that. I think yeah. it'd be really interesting for everybody to see, you know, how, how you received in Midland and McAllen and uh, yeah. College and, Station. And we, because we did, we did, we did collect them yeah, all up. We, we, we set up a system to track all that, so we could tell what was happening. So. I, I think it's, a, I think it was a great uh, idea and a great effort to do that because it's just really spread the word, reminding people about the Alamo. Uh, you know, I, I think I first came in fourth grade. I think we can just, I think it's really a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a jewel of San Antonio, but also the state of Texas. So, you know, there's a lot of proud Texans out there. And it's interesting what people have in their attic or whatever. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm shocked at what 
been in somebody's family. Uh, well, I, I'd like to, you know, it's a, it's some of the, the GLO actually sent staff on this as well, along with the said archivists and some of their people along. But the, for, for the staff that did this, and I went to, I went to two of the events, I think all, but they like went on the road and they like, they get to stay in, in pretty inexpensive hotels uh, with a, that probably most of us wouldn't want to select for our own personal vacations. Uh, and travel on a bus from place to place to place and do a show every night. So they were away from their families and their homes and, and traveling. They were working pretty hard uh, to do this, but that's the commitment you have with the people who are here and, and, and the archives people of the GLO. You know, they're really there to, to serve the citizens of Texas and the out there. So kudos to them. It wasn't easy to go on the road for all those nights. Great, thanks for that. Um, uh, Next item is if you can give us an update on upcoming projects. Uh, that so some of the programs we've got coming up, of course, we're, we're continuing with the cannon restoration project until we get all the cannons restored. Um, we, it's outside the time period for reporting, so it's, this is a, we have military dam on May 6th, so it's actually outside the board report period, but it's that already already happened. It was a great event, uh, which included the military drill team performance in Alamo Plaza. Um, we're also doing programming on each military branch's birthday. So in June, we'll have the Army. In August, we have the Post Guard. The Coast Guard in September, the Air Force. October, we have the Navy. Um, in November, we've got the Marine Corps. In December, we have the National Guard. Um, we're continuing a lecture series. It's really been very popular received. Uh, yesterday, we had a lecture here uh, with Pam Rosser, our conservator, uh, talking about the work that she's done, packed the room out, and was uh, really highly attended and really appreciated. We've got special programming going on on Independence Day and Veterans Day, and we're doing our normal kind of quarterly themed uh, events as well. And we're we're doing movie nights, so if you want to come sit in Alamo Garden and, and watch a movie some night, um, it, it's it's a fun evening as well. So um, we've got lots of things that are going on, and, uh, and we encourage everybody to get online and sign up on our for our newsletter so you know about all the events that are happening and come and participate. I want, to, I want to thank you for the newsletter. I've been receiving my newsletter and I forget about things and I really appreciate it popping up and people ought to sign up for it because it's really helpful to know this is what's going on with the album. I think the lecture series that we've added this yeah. year has been really well received across the board and great effort by our education department. Great, well, thank you for, and, and please thank the staff and, uh, for all their hard work. Uh, sounds like everything's moving forward. I appreciate the, you know, the tracking of, of uh, you know, attendance and, and rentals, etc. Because really, it's, it's 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 important to be able to track our progress and, and, and always work to improve that. <coughs> uh, next item uh, is a uh, comment from the public. Uh, Doug, you want to kind of just re restate kind of what the general guidelines sure. are there? So. Um, so we're going to open it up for public comment at this point. We're not going to respond to comments. This is a chance for us to listen. So, we'll, so, so we'll, and I'll make notes of the comments we'll make, and we're also recording everything. So we would ask that the people who have something they want to share uh, with the board, you come to the microphone over here. You speak to the microphone. And as you speak, what I will do is I will call out your name, and I'll call out the name of the next person. So maybe the next person in line can go and stand behind them so we don't spend too much time kind of um, Kind of uh, we have three minutes allotted for each person. Uh, we would ask to go on in three minutes. Um, it's important that they be, those of you who are on the list, um, we need you to be respectful of people at the, at the tail end of the list. So, um, so we uh, go ahead and start that. And, and you'll let me do it. I've got a timer. We've got a really fancy timer here. And we'll go, you'll hear it go beep, 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 and then I'll, and then, and I'll uh, and when you hear it go beep, 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 and then we'll wrap it up. So, um, first person is uh, Lamar Henry, and Lamar is going to be followed by uh, Maggie Reddy. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Come here this morning to express my opinion about the Cenotaph and reimagining the Alamo. We are just a few, but we speak for many people here in San Antonio, Texas. The input from experts can be important, but will always be biased. It is the input from many informed citizens. That's truly important. The will of the people to reflect policy, not the agenda of a few committee members, produced.
produce behind closed doors. There has been transparency from the beginning. There might not be such controversy now. If local Texas investors were included in the start for the master plan instead of out of state or even out of country groups, it would be easier to believe that Texas history and honor of those fallen at the Alamo was always up of most in mind during the planning stages. The Cenotaph is an empty tomb, a giant tombstone to honor the brave men who died at the Alamo, fighting for the land they loved, and they were willing to die for it. The plans to remove the Cenotaph indicates the writers of this plan do not understand the great importance here, or they don't care. This structure rests on the very ground they died on, the battlefield. The battlefield itself will never be just as it originally was, and it doesn't have to be. Other historical battlefields around the country contain memorial markers and stat statues on geography. It's not exactly the way it was at the time. It's the story, the narrative of the siege and the battle that matters. The story that one and a half million people or more visitors a year come uh, to hear and to experience. His story is already well known. It doesn't need to be rewritten to satisfy a few people biased and sometimes bigoted agenda. The Alamo Battleground and the Cenotaph is no different than these others. To rebuild the wall to its original height would obscure the chapel, for instance. And there is no point whatever of cutting down all the trees. The Cenotaph even if it could be moved without damage to some remote spot, would lose its connection to the Alamo, would lose its meaning as a marker for men who defend, who fought to defend the land we know as Texas. Leave the Cenotaph where it is, repair it in place. Make repairs to the Alamo structure, something that should have been being done all along, but drop the huge money-making agenda to reinvent the Alamo. Thank you. My name is Maggie Wright, and I came all the way from Burleson this morning, and thank y'all for allowing us to speak. And this is very uh, dear to my heart because I'm a fifth generation Texan on my daddy's side, and on my mother's side. I'm a mother of the daughters of the Republic of Texas, but I'm here on behalf of myself speaking. Um, it's most important that we leave the cenotaph right where it is. I've, I've researched it, and I, you know, it's been there since 1940. Um, it was, it's a war memorial for the defenders of the Alamo. And it is a monument that our federal government, this, this is $100,000 that they gave in the centennial for this monument. And if we pay taxpayer dollars to tear it down, take, disassemble it, they say, and repair it, It'll, it'll tear it up. And they say they're going to place it somewhere else in a more prom prominent location. The most prominent location is right where it is. It needs to stand right there. It is for our defenders. And I have a, uh, a paper here that's dated November the 15th, 1939. It says the State Board of Control accepts the Alamo Cenotaph. Everybody in unison, this Texas, in the, the state control, with the federal dollars and the city of San Antonio, they accepted the Alamo Cenotaph and put it right where it was. And uh, I have a document that is an ordinance deed. It's I-66, and it has a restriction on that deed. It says that this property shall not be used, shall not be used for anything else other than what intended. If you move that Cenotaph, you cannot use that property for anything else. And I, I want to read quickly. This is from uh, Copini, the sculptor. He says, now let us look to the front and the face of the group that I call the spirit of sacrifice. The top figure and symbolic of the heroic, noble, sublime sacrifice rising from the death of the flesh from the funeral pyre on which all of the bodies were burned by the victor. After being killed in the furious uneven struggle for their adopted country's liberty and independence ever put up by a small band of the greatest heroes ever known in our history as they were not surprised 
but refused to surrender. And as they dedicated themselves to such a faith, so by their death, the state of Texas may be born. Their soul ascends into heaven, emanating from a manic, mangled, burning flesh. The spirit of sacrifice goes on and on to reach glorious immortality. And it shall continue to flourish an inspiration, patriotic devotion, and a sense of gratifying pride to the present and future generations. But we have to leave it there for it to be able to do that. If we remove it, it is a shame to Texas. And Texans do not know this is taking place. I go all over Texas. Good morning. My name is Tanya Benson from Fredericksburg, Texas. I appreciate that we actually have an open meeting this morning because the more transparency we have, the better. I'm here um, in favor of leaving the Senate where it is, and I like to say the, the two people who went before me underscore everything they said completely agree with them. We have to leave the spirit of the those who died here, the defenders, in honor and respect them. And that cenotaph needs to stay right where it is. Don't mess with the cenotaph. Don't mess with the Alamo. We don't need it reimagined. Mr. Land Commissioner George B. Bush, I beseech the City Council of San Antonio and the Mayor um, Ron Nuremberg to recognize that this has been there. There's nothing wrong with the way it is right now. If you need to restore it, restore it in place. Don't mess with Texas, don't mess with the Cenotaph, and don't mess with the Alamo. How's it going? My name is Brandon Burkhardt. I'm the president of This Is Texas Freedom Force. We are a nonprofit organization that works in the preservation of Texas history. Uh, we, right, currently, we are pushing about 10,500 members uh, within our organization all across the state of Texas. We do not deal with anything outside of Texas. The Cenotaph is an important issue, if not the pinnacle of, of what we're working on right now with you guys. Uh, we have been all over Texas. We have listened to Texans all over. And they have spoken to us about the Cenotaph, and there's not one that we have spoken with that thinks that the Cenotaph should be removed. The Cenotaph is put there for a place, and it's put there for a reason, and that's to honor those that fought here at the Alamo. It's to honor those that, uh, you know, it, it's put there so that that way, whenever you were looking directly at the Alamo, you would look over and see that. And I've seen more people that will walk up and look at those names on there, because I'm actually locally here in San Antonio. And they will sit there and read those names, and I've had many conversations with them, especially those from out of state as well. And each one of them thinks that it's wrong that you'd be able to, to remove the cenotaph or move it to another location. I will apologize to you guys because I'm not as prepared as I should have been. I've been in surgery and just got out of the hospital, so I haven't been able to prepare everything for you. But we do speak at, at the San Antonio City Council meetings every Wednesday. And we have been on top of, of Mary Brown, Nuremberg, uh, Trevino, which I think Trevino shouldn't even be involved in this. Um, he is, uh, the man is responsible for removing the Travis Park Monument. That's part of our Texas history, no matter any way you look at it. And now he's working on trying to remove the cenotaph here you know, at the Alamo. The, the Alamo is sacred to all of us. It's the heartbeat of Texas. This is where we all live and die with freedom of Texas within us, at least those of us that are born. I'm a fifth generation Texan. Um, I can link my, my heritage all the way back to the natives. My, my family is mostly Comanche on my mother's side. And so, although they didn't fight at the Alamo, I still feel a sense of pride in that Alamo. And I still, I, I, I know Miss White, and I know the Alamo Defenders descendants, and they've done great work with this Alamo, uh, with working with the Alamo and trying to protect it. and, and They've done a lot of good work with the Cenotaph as well. And so I just ask you guys that you would please pay attention to what the people are saying. I know that uh, Mr. McDonald has said that there's a lot of positive feedback and stuff like that. Well, yeah, whenever you're feeding them a line, they're going to think that. 
But whenever you're telling them what's true about the Cenotaph and what's going on with the Alamo and the Reimagining Alamo project, then that's when Texans are starting to get angry about that. And uh, you know, we're we're not trying to say that we're completely against the entire plan. You know, the restoration should be done, but leave the Cenotaph where it is and make sure that you're honoring the Alamo instead of disrespecting. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Lane Woods. Um, I've come here with the uh, This is Texas Freedom Force um, uh, to speak with you all today over the Alamo Cenotaph. Um, I think it's quite laughable, uh, Mr. McDonald, that you say you want to preserve the history of the Alamo when you want to reimagine the Alamo. Well, that's not, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to re remember the Alamo. You can reimagine it all you want, but there's no need to move the cenotaph in order to do that. It's an example of fiscal irresponsibility and your unwillingness to listen to the, rep to the people that you represent. This is a decision that you're trying to make for all of Texas, not just San Antonio. It's such a short-sighted thing to think that you know, you're doing this for San Antonio, and it's a slap in the face to true Texans and freedom-loving Americans all over. And the words that are inscribed on the bottom of the cenotaph, um, I have in italics here, it says, they chose to never surrender nor retreat. This was, a, this was a spirit before Texas even existed. They chose never to surrender nor retreat. So be ready for Texans now, because that spirit is still alive, and no matter what anyone does, it will continue to live forever. Yeah, yeah. I, this is probably my fourth time appearing before a council of any type, and usually I'm yelling at either the mayor or the district committee himself. I come here today just to kind of not yell at you. I do kind of respect this board a lot more than our city council currently. Um, I come here as a descendant of an Alamo defendant. My ancestor is Squire Dave, and he was here on two separate occasions, once in 1835 to take this Alamo and make it a Texas fortress, and again, he defended when Travis wrote his letter for reinforcement. It's the only two, the only party to reinforce the Alamo. I stand again, kind of in that same light in my lineage, is to come here and defend the Alamo, and in particular, the Cenotaph. The Cenotaph does not need to be removed. It does not need to be moved to Market Street or Market Park where there are other statues. It needs to stay exactly where it is because the names that are on there, they do not have any physical remains left. There are no gravestones. There are there is no cemetery. They were burned. And we are told, although, however, it's debatable whether it's accurate, that uh, San Fernando Cathedral has a box of remains. The cenotaph is the epitome of respect for those men that are no longer existing in remains. There is no way to go to a graveside and pay your respect. So we have the cenotaph in front of the Alamo where the most intense fighting occurred and where those men ultimately were done away with. To move it down the block, or off of where it is, is not only disrespectful, it's heinous. It's almost as if you're taking something that was put there for its original intent and disrespecting it by moving it out of spite. I don't know what the obsession is with monument removal in this day and age across the nation, especially here in San Antonio. We do see, again, Brandon stated that we have Councilman Trevino behind the removal of the Confederate monument. You can argue all you want about the Confederacy, but the Alamo is a different issue. That is unity or freedom, and it, it occurred a, a good 30 years before the Civil War ever became an issue. So to some people, they want to make it a racist issue. It is not racist. This, this cenotaph is literally the most non-biased way of paying respects to those men of all creeds and colors. They were unified to fight for their way of life, their freedom, and their independence. And to move the cenotaph, I think, would would detract from that message. I think that it would only serve to forget. This is the same message I've given the city council, and I will continue to give them as well. But it will only serve to forget, to remember the Alamo you can meet with Cenotaph. It helps those who, in this day and age, are more glued to their cell phone than they are the walls of this sacred Alamo. They would rather check something out on Facebook than they would read a placard on the middle of the street. And that is a sad fact of life, but 
by leaving the cenotaph there in all its glory, it might give this new generation a glimpse rather than what's on their social media. Thank you for your time. I will return if we're allowed. You tall guys. Good morning. My name is Lee Spencer White. I represent the descendants of the men, women, and children who were inside the Alamo Garrison. That's from Abamio, Esparza, Travis, Jennings, Trammell, all of them. And I assure you that we, as a group, and I'm talking about thousands of people, do not want to move the Senate Act. There's only one descendant, and he has an agenda, that, that's willing to stand up and say, move it. Again, what these people said, it's in the right location. It's where their body separated from their soul, right there. And not at the front gate, not down the street, not anywhere other than right where it sits. That's where we would like for it to stay. And I assure you, we have a change.org. You can look it up, uh, save the cenotaph. And in less than two weeks, we had 10,000 signatures saying, don't move the cenotaph. I had a lady from Eastland, Texas, didn't even know the lady, sent me a thousand names of people she went and gathered. Uh, this is without any effort. Stand outside the cenotaph, talk to the visitors. Every one of them goes, says, why do they want to move it? No, we love this. I said, I don't have a good answer. So it can look like the mission period when you still look at buildings around, you know. Honestly, I don't know. All I do know is that if you move that cenotaph, you're throwing dirt in the face of the Alamo defenders. battlefields and I was particularly impressed by the monuments that were on those sites. Monuments were built on those battlefields in honor of the participants of the battles that were fought there. And from the time I was three or four years old, I would stand and look up at the faces on those monuments. And it made a huge impression on me. The Alamo is the site of a battlefield as well. The Cenotaph is a monument to those brave defenders of liberty who died on that battlefield. It was a bold reminder that liberty is a cause that men of courage were willing to die for. The defenders of the Alamo don't have grave sites for their descendants to visit. Their bodies were burned to ashes by the dictator Santa Ana, a tyrant who had abolished the Constitution. The defenders of the Alamo were unwilling to live under tyranny and were willing to give their very lives for the cause of liberty. The Cenotaph stands as a reminder to all who visit the Alamo that brave Texans valued liberty over their own lives. It would be a dishonor to their sacrifice to remove that monument from the site of the battlefield on which they gave their lives so that future Texans would live in a land of liberty. Thank you. I'm Lupe Rivera. I'm born and raised in the state of Texas. And I have the same uh, feelings that the rest of the speakers have, have said. Uh, to begin with, the uh, battle for Texas, the fight started because of the Mexicanos. They wanted liberty from Santa Ana. And then along came Travis, Sam Houston. Bless those men for coming and helping and forming the army that they did to defend Texas, to make it a country. And this cenotaph represents for us, the Mexicanos, as well as all Tejanos, something sacred. And for it to be removed someplace else, as I've heard gossip and talk that it's going to be moved to Market Square. What's at Market Square? Nothing but a bunch of, forgive me, partying with drunks. That's not where the cenotaph should be. The cenotaph is to stay where it's at right now. All the men that were piled up, you don't know if there were some still living. And Santa Ana had them all burned. And all these bodies were destroyed there. Probably leaving people still living. And for this cenotaph to be removed and 
disrespected in such a manner? I, I, I don't know what to say. The words can't express what I'm feeling and what I'm sure a lot of other Texans are feeling. Texans, Tejanos, Mexicanos, however you want to call us. We're all in it together. And that's all I have to say. Hi, good morning. My name is Don Mathis. I'm a concerned citizen. Thank you, uh, members of the board, for uh, for hearing us, and, and thank you, members of the media, uh, Record Report Express News Nowcast, for for keeping this meeting open. Um, I'm a San Antonio resident. As a lover of history, uh, I think number one on the agenda is to fix the crumbling chapel. As a citizen of San Antonio, I would like to see the the, the plaza kept open to traffic. If uh, people are concerned about the vibrations, we'll stop the buses, stop the trucks, but keep Alamo Street open to cars. Uh, I'm all in favor of moving forward with the Phil Collins collection. Uh, I'm very against any walls on the Alamo Plaza. As a lover of nature, uh, I want to keep the trees. Uh, the Alamo should be kept uh, free and open. Uh, I know there's charges for photographs, there's charges for guided tours, but the Alamo should always be free and open to the public. Uh, finally, I, I believe we should keep the Pompeo Fabini sculpture where it is. I see no reason to move it. Uh, don't move the cemetery. Keep, keep the spirit here. Thank you. Thank you. My name is John Hennett, and I belong to too many organizations to bore you with listing all of those. I attended the Alamo Society Symposium here in San Antonio in March. At that particular meeting, Mr. McDonald presented an update on the master plan, and included in that master plan was a pictorial of what was still the original George Sermay's plan. I have to assume what was said earlier during the board meeting that that plan is still in effect, minus the glass walls. Maybe. I have yet to see anything in writing about that. And I'm here to tell you that as I approach age 79, I no longer have the luxury of being nice, so I'll just be outspoken and say that is a garbage plan. Any plan that does not include rebuilding of the original laws is a garbage plan, period. There are objections to that. There are people that say it cannot be done. They list reasons, and those reasons I find are not reasons, but excuses. Texas and Texans are noted for doing the impossible jobs that nobody else will consider doing. We can rebuild those walls. Does this trust this endowment board is ignoring the visitors to the Alamo. They are the customers of the Alamo. Every poll that's ever been taken says they want to see rebuilding, and yet they are totally ignored. They're just little people. The plan the museum will have a fee to it, and yet it will house the Phil Collins collection. And then Phil Collins specifically stated that he wanted his collection to be on display free to the public, but to see this in the museum, you will have to pay that fee. I can say a lot more, but I feel my blood pressure coming up, so I'll just quit with that. Do not proceed with a garbage plan that does not include rebuilding these Alamo walls. Thank you. My name is Don Dixon. I've been a long time resident of San Antonio. I've been, been in business here. But I actually speak uh, kind of in memory of my wife. She was a daughter. Uh, she was on the Alamo Committee. Uh, she helped me run the Alamo for six to eight years. And I want to tell you there's nothing like the volunteer work that these ladies did for 110 years free of charge for the state of Texas. The Texan 
Texas never had a better deal than when they had their daughters going to the Ottoman. The problem that has arisen, and my wife would, would express this, I'm sure, very, very, very succinctly, is the reimagining of the Alamo plan. In closing off the streets, closing off Alamo Plaza, putting up walls, restricting people from this iconic facade that the daughters built up all those 110 years is wrong and should not, and should not be done. There's a lot of heroes other than my wife, Helen Gibral, uh, and, and others uh, that were concerned and they even went to the city in 1975, and they got an agreement with Mayor Cockrell that no changes to Amal Plaza would be made without the daughters, that they knew how hard this access was. So closing out the streets is problematic. You have to have visibility and access to, to a world icon like this. You, have, you, you cannot close people off. You have to have, have, to have let them have access. And you have to have a lot of have visibility. Taking the plaza back to dirt and taking out those flags, flagstones where people can now move freely, it's just wrong. This this part of the plan is, is what the people are very, very concerned about. Obviously, moving the center that beach, that should be done. It's all part of what we have in there. Other issues that's come up on the state level is differential of responsibility. In my opinion, it was a mistake for the state to take the album away from the daughters. To me, that was a mistake. But they did. So now, if the state is going to be in charge, there should be a straight line of, of responsibility for that. Let the state do it. Mixing private and public is problematic. So we, we need to take a look at that. This is a legislative issue, but you're the ones that's represented the private part here. Which, but this, this is a problem for the people of Texas. And $106 million in two sessions is a lot of money. $75 million of that was from the rainy day fund. So we need to know where all that money is going. It's spent well, and the Alamo is protected for the citizens of the people of Texas in the future. Thank you. We, uh, we really appreciate uh, everyone coming this morning and all the interest. Um, uh, and it's impressive and, and, and proud to hear Texans proud about the Alamo. So thanks everybody for coming. And, and I just copied Mr. Dixon we owe a, we owe a real debt to the dollars for everything they did all the Amen to that. Here, here. Well, thanks everybody. Um, any other? I entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Speed is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank for you all. Appreciate it. So, so the planning process, which is a continuum, continues. And it's being, it's based on the original master plan, but that was. That was broad concepts of doing several fundamental things. It includes closing the streets, it includes reclaiming the original uh, mission footprint, it includes building a new museum, it includes restoring the, the church, the long barrack, it includes building you know, new exhibits and programming content and doing everything we can to have a world class experience for the public. That's what the master plan calls for. Now, what does that look like? We're now in the process of designing what those things would look like well, at the next so level. So, love what does the site look Listen, like? My, How's site configured more specifically? Shades. All of those are details. Uh, everybody so we're going to show in the next round. Oh, good. And yeah. I always make you use one of your uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> coasters. <laughs> 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 you guys take those or something. Yeah. 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 I need to talk to them. Those are still there. Those are special. They'll make you a belt. Cut it up. Well, the final master plan never had walls in it. They don't have a big plant. They have ladies all throughout. Yeah. So yeah, there were an they're early yeah, early I, concepts of the master plan had, had glass structural walls. Uh, those were never in the final master plan. So so that 
that's, that's kind of old. Thank you. That's, driving over so that's not atomic. Can you get something? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I definitely don't want to perpetuate stuff. Right. I'd like to point people to what is the current. Sure. Right. And you go to our website. We actually have a website that actually summarizes the master plan. It's not the full, I mean, the full document's hundreds of pages, but we have a, we have a website that kind of more simply explains what's actually in the master plan. And, and the details of it continue to be worked out. And now we're into, so we have a master plan. Now what does it look like to do that? We did the master plan which did not deal with the history, the historical content, what's going to be in the museums. What are the what are the narratives that need to be told? So what are all what are all the stories you need to tell to fully tell the story of of, of the Alamo of San Antonio? And it's a it's a it's a three hundred year you know history. So um, so we want to tell all that, and, we, and it will focus on the eighteen thirty six events, um, eighteen thirty five and thirty six actually, but on that Texas Revolutionary period, it'll focus on that. But um, but it's a that's the phase we're in now, and then how does that actually organize on the site? So, where do we tell about how? Where do we talk about the the Texas Revolution, the Battle of 1836? Where do we talk about the mission? Where do we talk about the about the the domestic life that took place around here when it was when it was a mission and and you know all those times before and after the Battle of 1836? There was there was just people living here in. It was the center of of the of their city, so all of that story has to get organized on the site. So we're doing that now. Um, and what about to the the what, what's the status of the cenotaph right now? Is that the, the cenotaph is, is there discussion of moving it? Is there is it still in play? Is the cenotaph in the door? The master plan decision? clearly called for relocation of the cenotaph to reclaim the original mission footprint to the 1836 time period. So every effort was made to 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 take that space where the original mission footprint to the 1836 time period. It's it's a hundred years later, yes. And that's not something at this point that is up for discussion or anything? No, there's, there's everything yeah, you know, there'll be a plan. It'll be taken to the public. The citizens' advisory committee will be engaged in that process. There'll be public meetings and discussions. Uh, there's been no final decisions on anything. This is still a process. Yes. 